The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Hello and, help, and welcome to Health for a Lifetime. I'm your host, Don McIntosh, and today we're delighted to have in the studio with us Dr. David DeRose from the Lifestyle Center of America. Welcome, Dr. DeRose. Good to be here with you, Don. We certainly are glad that you could take time out of your busy schedule, and we're excited about uh, what's happening at the Lifestyle Center. Some of the people that are watching may not know about the Lifestyle Center of America. Uh, what exactly is that, and what do you do, do in, at that facility? Well, Don, first of all, I'm a physician. I have uh, an MD degree. I have specialties in internal medicine and preventive medicine. And really, those are the kind of things that we do at the Lifestyle Center. We, we have an internal medicine approach. In other words, looking at general uh, adult diseases, especially chronic diseases. And there in southern Oklahoma, we have a state-of-the-art facility where we help people from a Christian perspective to address lifestyle-related diseases. So, so things like diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, uh, problems with weight, nicotine addiction, a whole host of problems that relate to our health and our ability to serve and to minister, these are the targets of our ministry there at the Lifestyle Center. So whatever the problem is, well actually these are the main problems in North America are Western diseases, so-called Western diseases. That's exactly right. Now I will tell you we don't have a cancer treatment program and we don't deal with uh, certain chronic diseases that are outside of our, our range of expertise, but really the basic uh, killing diseases like stroke, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and the risk factors are things that we're addressing. Well, today we want to talk a little, a little bit about risk factors, and I guess you mentioned to me before the segment here that there, there are literally hundreds of those now that we can identify that lead to these killers. One of those is really the subject that we want to focus on, homocysteine. What is homocysteine? I mean, a lot of people say, you know, what? Uh, yeah, homocysteine is what we call an amino acid. Okay. It's, a, it's a protein building block. So if you look at a, a protein, it's kind of a string of molecules, and it's got these building blocks, these amino acids. And uh, one of those amino acids is homocysteine. Now, homocysteine isn't normally something that, uh, that we just uh, conjure up. It's made actually from another amino acid that we eat called methionine. Okay, methionine. So we eat this and then it, it's, it's built into homocysteine. Well, why is homocysteine so important? Well, you know, a lot of people didn't think much about homocysteine. There was a rare genetic problem where people would get these really sky-high levels of homocysteine, and they had accelerated uh, risk of heart disease. This has been known for years, and when a, uh, a physician researcher by the name of Kilmer McCulley suggested that homocysteine in more moderate elevation could be a heart disease risk factor, he basically was, was kind of laughed out of the... Uh, uh, the medical discussions. This was some years ago. But now, Don, there's a whole wealth of medical research. It's coming from Scandinavia. It's coming from the United States. It's coming from Canada. coming from all over the world. And it's saying that as our homocysteine level rises, our risk of heart attack, stroke, and blockage in blood vessels in general, like blockage in blood vessels to the legs, all dramatically increases. So maybe we should have in our car a gas gauge, a, a water gauge, and a homocysteine level gauge. Well, I mean, that would be taking it to the extreme. But actually, your point is well taken, mm -hmm. because homocysteine, for most people, is not even on the, on the radar screen. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing in the medical community is this is emerging as a very important risk factor for heart disease. So how does it work? What does it do? When I have homocysteine in my blood, blood, I assume it's in the blood, it and, I, and I have it swirling around in there, what does it do uh, that causes heart disease? Well, it seems to do a number of things. I mean, the most critical thing that we've pretty much nailed down from what we call the epidemiology, that's the population studies, is that as this level goes up, it increases heart disease risk. 
Now, the million dollar question is the one you're asking, why? I mean, why would rising levels of homocysteine increase the risk of blockage in the arteries? And what it seems to be is that homocysteine does a number of nasty things. I mean, it, it damages the blood vessel lining. How exactly does it do that? Well, it seems to have to do with free radicals. These are very reactive compounds that then can damage other tissues. And the blood vessel lining seems to be one of the tissues that is susceptible to this free radical damage caused by homocysteine. Uh, free radical, I mean, that just sounds like something I want to be, you know, like just boom, bang, bang, but that's not good. It's just like a, a missile flowing flying around in there and, and, and it damages everything it hits. That's right, it's like a loose cannon, if you will. And, and what's happening, these free radicals, they just bang into tissues, damaging them. And that seems to be one of the ways that homocysteine does its dirty work. Okay, so we have to, we have to negate homocysteine. We have to do something with it. Uh, what should we do to lower our risk from these problems? What can we do to lower the homocysteine level? Well, one of the things we know clearly, Don, is that B vitamins, three particular B vitamins, help to lower homocysteine levels. Okay. They're B6, also known as pyridoxine, folic acid, and then B12. Those three definitely lower homocysteine levels. B6, folic acid, and B12. What, what other things could lower it? Well, actually, this is the whole subject of a lot of discussion and research right now. In March of 2000, at the Lifestyle Center of America, we actually published research in the journal Preventive Medicine on patients going through our program. Mm -hmm. And what we found is without giving them any folic acid, without giving them any B6, without giving them any B12, right. these people dramatically lowered their homocysteine levels about 13% in just one week. Wow. And so the question was, well, what are we doing? in our lifestyle program that's causing this dramatic lowering. And we discussed it in the paper. We suggested, based on other research, that there's some other things happening that may give further benefits when it comes to homocysteine lowering. Such as? Well, one of them has to do with dietary choices beside B vitamins. Case in point is fiber. Uh, some research has actually looked at fiber and how this contributes to folic acid levels in the blood. There's research coming out that suggests that if you eat more fiber, more whole grains, things of this nature, you know, getting the wheat bran, not just the, the white uh, wheat flour, what happens is somehow in the intestine that changes the normal good bacteria in an even more favorable way so that the bacteria make folic acid. It's actually been demonstrated that you can raise folic acid levels in the blood by eating more fiber. So that's one possibility. A second one has to do with methionine. Remember us talking about that Yeah, a methionine. Bit. Now, you just hear the word methionine, you go, boy, I need to have some of that. That sounds good. Well, actually, methionine <laughs> is converted into homocysteine. Oh, so it's not good. It's not looking real good. All right. And uh, I saw a patient a while back, and he had a jar of methionine. He, he thought it was good, too. And, and I told him there's some cause for concern with methionine. <laughs> It's interesting, Don, you know, the diet that has been shown to be the most effective in reversing blockages in heart blood vessels. I mean, I know you know, and, and many of our, our viewers know, of the work of Dr. Dean Ornish. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ornish, back in 1990, first published research showing that you could reverse blockages in heart arteries by using a lifestyle program that included basically what was a, a vegetarian diet, a total, almost a total vegetarian diet. Oh, no. So you're going to take away all our good foods? Well, actually, Don, that's not our motive. What we're trying to do, when these people come to us at the Lifestyle Center for two or three weeks often, they're wanting to get the maximal results in a short time. Mm -hmm. And if they've got heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, a vegetarian-type diet seems to work the best for those conditions. Here's the point, though, when it comes to methionine. These foods in the vegetarian diet tend to be much, much lower in methionine than an animal-based diet. For example, you take a standard serving of hamburger or, or some other flesh food, uh -huh. and you're going to have 600 to 900 milligrams of methionine in those foods. That then goes right into homocysteine. goes right into homocysteine. Let me, let me just contrast that for a minute. You take carrots or potatoes or, or whole wheat bread, you're maybe getting 10, 20, maybe 40 milligrams of methionine per serving. So you see, when you're talking in the hundreds, 800, 900 range for some of these flesh products, you want to stay away from those things if you're trying to get your homocysteine levels down. Do vegetarians ever have high homocysteine levels? They can. And in fact, vegetarians are at risk for high homocysteine levels if they're not careful with their vitamin B12 status. Okay, so they have to have a very balanced 
and maybe supplemented diet because uh, vitamin B12 is not produced in, in the diet, is it? That, that's correct. It's not produced in the body. In the body. And uh, it is the product of bacterial action. So hopefully it's not produced in your diet. That would mean your food's been, you know, sitting out unrefrigerated <laughs> or something. But, but, but the point is, Don, when people go on a total vegetarian diet, when they're trying to get rid of all the animal products, that will tend to decrease the methionine load, but they do want to ensure an adequate source of B12. That's very important. So what are the supplements then that you uh, recommend at the Lifestyle Center? What do you do for the vitamin B12? Okay, if someone has mildly elevated levels of homocysteine, since we've demonstrated that our overall lifestyle approach mm -hmm. lowers homocysteine, we say, listen, go with our standard program, have the homocysteine level rechecked in two or three months. If their level is very high, now someone's probably saying, well, you know, what's high, what's very high? Normal range, probably around 9 to 11, ideal is below 7. Okay. okay. And uh, I won't go into the technicalities of the unit measurements. It's in micromoles per liter. But um, anyway, the, remember the number seven as being ideal. What we want to do, let's say someone's level is 15, twice mm -hmm. ideal. Mm -hmm. We'll probably, in that case, put them on B vitamins. And I say probably, at the Lifestyle Center, we're, we're not in a dictatorial mode. It's not like I'm the commander in chief as one of the physicians and you listen to me. It's working with the we call them our, even our guests. We don't call them patients. Right. We work with our guests and try to get them uh, to look at these issues and say, are you interested in taking a B12, a B6, and a folic acid? And we'll often use that combination regimen, about 1,000 micrograms of B12, 25 milligrams mm -hmm. of B6, mm -hmm. and about 1,000 micrograms, 1,000 to 2,000 micrograms of folic acid. Uh, this may be totally off the subject, but you know today, one of the things that's really in vogue is, is what's called high-protein diets that help people lose weight rapidly and, and whatnot. And they say that you can eat all these foods that are very high uh, in probably methionine. Is this mm -hmm. dangerous in terms of homocysteine? Actually, one of the arguments that, that people are, are starting to put forward when it comes to the dangers of these high-protein diets is what is happening to homocysteine levels. Now, to my knowledge, Don, no one has studied this yet. From what we know about methionine, we'd expect that these levels would be rising on these diets, but it's not been looked at in any of the papers that I've seen. I will tell you this, though. A recent paper showed that by eating more fruits and vegetables, you lowered homocysteine levels. Okay, so uh, really the best plan is that simple vegetarian diet which is high in complex carbohydrates and kind of low in the protein area uh, when you're looking at this homocysteine thing plus having the, make, making sure, especially for the vegetarian, that you have the vitamin B12 in your diet. Right, and the thing really on the hit list is the meat protein, not so much protein per se, but meat especially. Now it, it is true Plant sources of protein do have some methionine, but usually in, in much lower amounts than the animal sources. What about tofu? Tofu actually is moderate in, uh, in methionine content. It's, you know, it's looking in the range of 100 to 200 uh, milligrams per serving compared to 6 to 800 for, for meat. That's probably because it's concentrated? Well, it is a concentrated food, but soy is a rich source of protein, and protein has that methionine as one of the building blocks in it. We're talking with Dr. David DeRose from the Lifestyle Center of America. You've probably sensed a little energy in this interview. I hope that you have. And that type of energy uh, will continue in the next half, I'm sure, as we talk more about homocysteine and your health. If you would like to contact the Lifestyle Center of America, let me give you a web page, www.lifestylecenter, all one word, lifestylecenter.org. Or you can contact us here at 3ABN and get information on how to contact Dr. DeRose and the Lifestyle Center. Join us when we come back. Have you found yourself wishing that you could shed a few pounds? Have you been on a diet for most of your life, but not found anything that will really keep the weight off? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, then we have a solution for you that works. Dr. Hans Deal and Dr. Eileen Luddington have written a marvelous booklet called Reversing Obesity Naturally, and we'd like to send it to you free of charge. Here's a medically sound approach successfully used by thousands who are able to eat more and lose weight permanently without feeling guilty or hungry through lifestyle medicine. Dr. Deal and Dr. Ludington have been featured on 3ABM, and in this booklet, they present a sensible approach to eating, nutrition, and lifestyle changes that can help you prevent heart disease, diabetes, and even cancer. 
Call or write today for your free copy of Reversing Obesity Naturally, and you could be on your way to a healthier, happier you. It's absolutely free of charge, so call or write today. Welcome back. We've been talking about your health. We've been talking about homocysteine. We've been talking about heart disease. All those big words, let's just recapitulate a little bit. Homocysteine is a protein or amino... Amino acid, a building block of protein. That yeah. just kind of swirls around in the blood when we have foods that are high in methionine that come from the meats and the dairy products and those different kind of things in our, in our diet. And then that causes free radicals to just mess us up. Is that well, right? That's putting it in a nutshell. I mean, it's <laughs> taken a few leaps with, uh, with some of the suggestions there is in the medical research literature, but I, I think that's a, putting a pretty good capsule on it, Don. <laughs> okay. Uh, we talked about ways to avoid having that problem, avoid uh, developing the atherosclerotic plaques that come from having high ho homocysteine levels. One of the things that you mentioned was the importance of B12 vitamins and then having foods as grown, simple uh, plant foods and whatnot. And then you mentioned fiber, but are there any other things that can uh, help us avoid uh, high homocysteine levels? There are, and, and, and maybe before we get into those, I need to reemphasize something. Okay. Because, you know, as a scientist and a researcher, as well as a clinician, I, I have to be sensitive when we're, we're communicating to the public. Right. And what's very well established with homocysteine is that folic acid supplements, B12 supplements, these lower homocysteine levels. Very conclusive, okay? B6 does not seem to make as much difference in a, in a fasting state, as far as your fasting homocysteine level. It okay. seems to be more important when you eat. These other things we've been talking about, methionine, the amount of methionine in the diet, and some of these other lifestyle factors, there's some very intriguing and suggestive evidence, including the research we've done at the Lifestyle Center. But I have to tell you, that's, it's a step below where we're at, uh, where we are with the B vitamin supplements. In other words, someone listening to the show, Don, I don't want them to walk out with the main message being that if they've got sky-high homocysteine, they should eat a little less meat. Uh, mm -hmm. They really need to first think about taking the, the folic acid, the B12, making sure they get the blood levels up on those B vitamins. Now, someone's going to say, Don, I know this. They're going to say, but Dr. DeRose, I want to do a natural approach. And I think as long as you're working with a physician, it's fine to go through these lifestyle measures we're talking about. But by all means, don't just rest assured that your homocysteine is going to be great if you're doing these lifestyle things, because there's still a lot we don't know. This is an emerging risk factor. So you need to get your level checked. That's right. That's the first step. If it's high, in addition to these other factors, Don, three things that we exclude at the Lifestyle Center seem to worsen homocysteine. That's okay. why we exclude them. All right. Coffee, alcohol, and smoking. Okay, now how does that work? Well, different mechanisms. Uh, the alcohol, for example, seems to interfere with, uh, oh boy, this is biochemistry, methyl groups. Boy, I, <laughs> and I, I, know, I know we're losing everybody now, All but right. it, it, the, the chemistry of, of homocysteine, when it's, when it's gotten rid of in the body, one way to get rid of homocysteine is to add a chemical structure called a methyl group. You add that to the homocysteine and it becomes methionine again. Okay, and then so the body can reverses. get rid of it. You put it in reverse. That's right, you put it in reverse. But and when you drink alcohol... It seems to mess up some of those methyl group, uh, sh methyl group shuffling in the body. The car can only go forward, it can't go backward. So well, you're headed to the precipice. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. I, I wouldn't say it's completely uh, locking that path, but it does seem to make some problems. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the mechanisms for smoking and uh, for, coffee, uh, for coffee intake are not really as clear in my mind. Uh, they've been shown in what we call epidemiologic studies when we look at large groups of people. It seems clearly that smoking does seem to worsen the problem. Uh, coffee has been suggested in one of the large uh, Norwegian studies. And the question is, does that really apply to American coffee as well? I'm looking here at the uh, article that you published in Preventive Medicine uh, right, I guess, this year, 2000, right? Um, and uh, I see here that you could get it on the web. Is that right? Um, you can actually contact us. We do have a handout 
that, okay. that, we, that summarizes that in lay terms. Yeah, maybe maybe those 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 folks that really do like the biochemistry, they're sitting down. What did he say? And they yeah. want to just trying to read. Yeah, find we go out. through the biochemistry in the paper, and all there's a nice those, diagram of things and all. Uh, so. www.lifestylecenter.org. They can figure out how to get this, or right. are calling you there at the Lifestyle Center. Well, let's talk a little bit about some other factors. What are some other things be uh, besides cutting out the cof coffee, the uh, smoking? and the uh, alcohol from our, uh, our diet. Well, a real exciting one has to do with phytoestrogens. These are uh, our plant estrogens. Again, it's in the paper, but let's, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's, let's yeah. unpack it a little bit yeah. here. Let, let's kind of step back a little bit, because what we know in women that estrogens seem to help lower homocysteine levels. And this, is, this is pretty clear in a number of the, the, the research studies. Well, what the question is, the bigger leap, is if you're getting these phytoestrogens, these plant estrogens, can this lower homocysteine as well? And we're suggesting this may be one of the ways that a vegetarian diet that uses things like soy products mm -hmm. can help to lower homocysteine. Again, right now I've got to say, Don, I mean, this is some speculation. It's kind of a little bit of leap as far as the, the research literature, but I think it's very promising, and research studies are being proposed that will look at this question. So you're seeing these trends at the Lifestyle Center. You're just trying to figure out the, why it's happening and document some of those different other factors besides just the folates, which everybody knows about. And I have to actually back up because the reason we have this question has to do with other research and results that we've seen at the Lifestyle Center and other centers where we're seeing people actually improve their heart disease status, whether it's decreasing their anginal pain, uh, less angina attacks, whether it's Dr. Ornish's study that mm -hmm. showed the blood vessels could open up, if you will. Mm -hmm. But we're saying, why do these things happen? Cholesterol alone doesn't explain it. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something else happening. And that's what inspired us to look at homocysteine. What about exercise? Exercise, I mean, that's a very good question. Uh, Scandinavian researchers in Norway have done some, some excellent work on homocysteine. In one of those studies, they actually showed that people that exercised more lowered their homocysteine better. So exercise may be a factor, and we're looking at this in some research we're currently doing at the Lifestyle Center of America. So you need more folks there for more research, don't you? Well, we're always, uh, always. We're always excited for people who have a vision to learn about what's happening in their bodies. You mentioned something else to me about iceberg lettuce, uh, and this could, could really have some connection with homocysteine. It really could. Uh, you know, Don, we were talking uh, there at the break uh, how you and I were both educated to stay away from that iceberg lettuce. You know, eat the, the romaine and the, the Kale deep green. And yeah, there you go. And the interesting thing is that iceberg lettuce is a very, very rich source of choline. Choline? Of, yes, choline. I just never would think of it. Give me some choline. <laughs> All right. Actually, choline is a very important molecule. It's used in, in, in the, the makeup, the building in your body of something called acetylcholine. For your nerves. That's right. There you go. But of interest, choline is also transformed in the body into something called betaine. Isn't that just fascinating? Betaine. <laughs> Explain betaine. Betaine actually is another <laughs> one of these compounds that can shuttle around methyl groups. Oh, you see, starting to sound that. familiar. We've gotta have that. Can bring that methyl group to the homocysteine. It's the reverse. There you go. Turns it back into methionine. All right. So it's 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 headed that free radical is gonna slam into it, but then it gets the choline group. It says, oh, 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 oh. I'm gonna go the, the, the other way. Group. Methyl from, group from the, from the choline. I'm gonna go the other way. There you go. So iceberg lettuce. There's more. It's just the tip of the iceberg when you eat it. All these things happen. Well, I, I won't try to elaborate on that analogy, Don. <laughs> but Don, it's not, just, it's not just iceberg lettuce. Even more rich in choline are peanuts. Peanuts. Peanuts are an even better source of choline than iceberg lettuce. But haven't I heard that peanuts can be harmful in heart disease? Um, I don't know who you heard that from. Actually, the, the research... Is that really good? The, the research is suggesting, Don, that, that nut consumption has beneficial effects when it comes to heart disease, and peanuts, even though they're a legume, in the studies that look at nut consumption, it often seems that peanuts is the main nut that people are consuming, at least here in America. So they used to call vegetarians and those that ate a plant-based diet peanuts, and they're so, that's, that's, uh, that's not a bad name if you're trying to address the homocysteine thing. Well, peanuts have some benefits. Now, I'm not telling people to load up on them. A few. 
A little dab will do you. Moderate amounts of peanuts, part of a good, healthy diet, and that's what the research seems to be suggesting. Iceberg lettuce, peanuts, and uh, all these other plant foods that, that have the uh, estrogens in it, Any, anything else we should be eating. Well, I think, you know, we've, we've hit on the main high points. I mean, the clear thing is making sure you're getting adequate amounts of these critical B vitamins. No question about the importance of those. I mean, the U.S. government has been, uh, has been moved by research on folic acid and heart disease to uh, have universal, really, uh, supplementation with folic acid. Now, of course, this helps to prevent pregnancy defects, what we call neural tube defects in, mm -hmm. in, in infants as well. But folic acid controversy has kind of moved a step beyond with the homocysteine research. So the B vitamins are critical. The plant-based diet seems to have some unique benefits, staying away from the alcohol, the tobacco, the coffee. These things have some definite pluses going for them when it comes to homocysteine. So you check for homocysteine levels at the Lifestyle Center, we do. Uh, but can you go to your local uh, physician and can you order that test? Most commercial labs are able now to, uh, to obtain homocysteine levels and we're encouraging people to check their homocysteine level. What else should be, people be testing, testing or checking for with heart disease? Very important. We, we don't want to you know, spend a whole talk on homocysteine and people think that the old risk factors are not important anymore. I mean cholesterol is still critically important. People should know what their cholesterol is. They should know what their LDL cholesterol is, which is the bad cholesterol. Very important. Those things are critical as far as heart disease risk. We should stop smoking. Even if homocysteine isn't on our radar screen, even if this presentation hasn't changed anybody's minds, smoking is still a potent risk factor for heart attack. Bigger than homocysteine? Um, right now, if you, have to, if you have to focus on one of the two, stop smoking first, then okay. get concerned about the homocysteine, okay? The other thing is that we don't want to minimize is blood pressure mm -hmm. and diabetes. These two diseases dramatically increase the risk of heart disease. These things need to be controlled. Obesity? Obesity, it's a big one, too. The deadly quartet. <laughs> the deadly quartet. <laughs> the so-called deadly quartet. Well, we've been talking with Dr. David DeRose. He's a physician at the Lifestyle Center of America. Um, where they've been doing cutting-edge research and helping people reverse the common diseases. We've been talking about homocysteine. If you're interested in more information about homocysteine, they have a handout on that at the Lifestyle Center. You can get their number by calling us here at 3ABN or by contacting them over the web at www.lifestylecenter.org. Uh, any closing thoughts for those who really sense that they have a problem with heart disease? You are a Christian physician. Um, working at a, at a Christian-motivated center. Uh, what's your counsels of the folks in our last uh, 30 seconds? You know, what's encouraging to me, Don, is you look at the original diet that God gave to Adam and Eve. It was a plant-based diet. And it's interesting that when you move to that diet, you not only address homocysteine, you tend to lower your cholesterol, you tend to, to promote weight loss, you tend to uh, lower your risk of diabetes. And it seems that God really gave Adam and Eve a diet that was designed for eternity there in the Garden of Eden. Thanks for joining us today on Health for a Lifetime. Uh, boy, I've learned a lot today. Uh, my head's kind of swirling a bit with all these methyl groups and different things that I've learned, but I have learned that there is one simple answer, and that's relying on God, His diet, His way, His plan for your life. Thanks so much for being with us, uh, Doctor, and we thank you for being with us, and we hope that as a result of today's program, you have health that lasts for a lifetime. Thank you.